church. Good evening. Good evening. We're continuing in our uh, series in Acts. And uh, tonight uh, I've titled it The Road to Damascus. Though I could have titled it to When Christ Shows Up. And just like Saul's life that we're going to go into, we are approaching a crossroads, both for many of us individually and as a nation. Faced with insuperable problems in a situation that seems to be hopeless until Christ shows up. Now, uh, most of us in the church world are familiar with Paul. Some of us may not realize, some of us do, that Paul was not born Paul. He was originally known as Saul, Saul of Tarsus. Uh, he was a very well-educated Jew, uh, educated in the law, the Torah, the Tanakh. There's been some scholarly discussions about whether he had sat on the Sanhedrin, with some saying he did and others that he was training or in line to. Uh, he would have been known as a, a diaspora Jew, uh, as opposed to the Jews who were in Judea that hung close to Jerusalem, he would have been one of many uh, educated Jews that was dispersed throughout the Roman Empire. And but, but Saul was in and near Jerusalem in this season when Stephen was martyred. And of course he's introduced as the one who hold the clothes, who's standing watch over the clothing of those who were stoning him to death. And he, he was very zealous for the law. As zealous for the law as he became zealous for Christ after he became a Christian. He wasn't content with simply putting the Jewish believers to death. He wanted to pursue the Christians wherever they were. He wanted to pursue the disciples of the Lord wherever they were. And the Romans, they had a slightly different take on the law it would probably be related instead of just solely just sanguini and what that is is that whatever nationality you were in that the ruling bodies of that nation would often have extraterritorial jurisdiction what this meant for the the jewish nation was that the sanhedrin could exercise authority over members of that nation over jews who were far outside of the geographical regions of Judea. And so we're going to see here that he had obtained authorization to be able to pursue uh, the early Christians. And he was planning to go to Damascus to take persecution to the early believers of Damascus. Or as in the words of Bush, we're taking a fight to them. And where we find the narrative here in verse uh, Acts 9 verse 1. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So you see here, he's, he's wanting a certificate from the high priest saying he has the authority to place people under arrest. And so he was going to go to Damascus, go into synagogues in the community. And if he found any that was believers in Jesus, he was going to bring them in chains to Jerusalem. Or so he thought. Saul did not get very far in that uh, endeavor. So he was journeying to Damascus. He was a man with a purpose. He was headed on a mission. But the mission he was headed on never finished. What happened? In Saul, this was a man who was as effective as a persecutor as he later was as an apostle of Christ. In other places it said that he began to destroy the church so his persecutions were such that maybe at least for a brief moment the numbers were actually starting to decline. And so he was going to Damascus in zeal but we see here in verse 3 that something happens on the road to Damascus. So what turns this man who hated the church, 
into uh, arguably the greatest apostle of all the apostles of Christ, one of the greatest Christians uh, the world has ever seen, one of the, the greatest among the people of God that the world has ever seen. What happened to bring about such a change in this man? Jesus Christ showed up. And so we see here, Saul was about to have an apostolic encounter with Christ. Verse 3, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? He knew he was having an encounter with the Lord. No, no doubt as one who was deeply studied in the law and the prophets, that he was intimately familiar with the prophetic visions, including the visions where the, the prophets would relay the, the heavenly visions. Like we see in Isaiah, Isaiah recounting in chapter 6 the vision where in the year King Uzziah died, he saw the Lord. He saw high lifted up, he saw the Shekinah glory. And so when the Shekinah glory hits Saul's eyeballs, he knows he's in the presence of God. But he's wondering what's going on because this wasn't what he planned. He thought that God's will was to go and kill as many Christians as he could kill. So he says, who are you, Lord? Boy, was he in for shock. Here the man who hated Jesus, who was waging war against the Lord Jesus and his disciples. And he asked, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. God was revealing a different plan to Saul. And what the goads would be is that they would be on a wagon or a plow that a horse or a mule would be attached to. And the goads was to discourage the animal from kicking back against the wagon to try to break free. And the harder they kicked, then their legs would go up against the goads and it would hurt. And so uh, eventually after an animal kicked a few times, the animal knew that it was yoked to the wagon or to the plow. And the animal would then be compliant to the purpose for which the animal was yoked and saddled. Jesus is telling them, our Lord Jesus, it's hard for you to kick against the goals. I am apprehending you to a different purpose. You came to kill me. You came to kill my disciples, but I'm sending you on a different purpose. Instead of killing my disciples, I am calling you to make disciples. And so Saul has this apostolic encounter. And this wasn't an ordinary encounter. This was the, the same experience of the Shekinah glory, the same vision of the resurrected Christ that the disciples had when they saw Jesus raised from the dead after he rose from the dead. And to show why that's significant, I could go to several passages here, but I'm just going to go back to Acts 1. We see similar language in 1 Corinthians 15, where it talks about those who had seen the resurrected Christ. And, and in Galatians, Paul talks about when he received the gospel, he did not receive it from men. He was not taught by men, but he was taught directly by the Lord Jesus Christ. In uh, Acts 1, 21 to 26. And this was during their prayer meeting in the upper room, the, the, the eight-day meeting where they were seeking God. They was praying, they was, they, were, they was pressing into the presence of God, waiting for the Holy Spirit to be poured out on them so that they could receive power to be witnesses. And, but they realized they had a problem. Jesus had picked 12, but one of them went into apostasy. One of them fell away. Judas fell away. And so Judas was therefore rejected. And he was rejected in such a profound way that Judas died before Jesus died. And he died a rather nasty death. And there's two accounts of it that some skeptics have argued was a difficulty, but it's not really a difficulty. In one account, we see that Judas hangs himself. But another account, his belly blows up and his innards fall out. And so the skeptics would say, which is it? This is a contradiction. No, it's not a contradiction. When someone is hung, a human or an animal, they start to decompose, and they die, they start to decompose. 
Now, if they're not taking off that noose and that oxygen still cut off, when they decompose, that gas builds up and the, the skin starts to break down. Eventually, what happens, that belly's going to pop open and the innards are going to come out. And so you see the, the account of Judas' death shows the detail to which the Bible is accurate. And so, but Judas was out of the way. And they realized there needed to be a successor. And just before our passage here, he quotes from a psalm where uh, David uh, says that, uh, and David was talking about those who had betrayed him, but it was really looking forward to Judas betraying Christ. And the psalm says, uh, let his place be desolate, and let his bishop wreck another man take. And so Peter said, based on this verse, we need to appoint a successor to Judas. And so in verses 21 to 26 that I'm about to read, we're going to see the qualifications. And we're going to see one in particular that is an absolute essential if you're going to claim to be an apostle of Christ. If you're using the term apostle to be more than a church planter, which that's a legitimate use of the term, and some groups will use the term apostle simply to mean a spirit-empowered church planter, but if you're talking about apostle as something more authoritative, there is one absolute requirement that you must meet to sit in that office, and it's a requirement that virtually none of today's so-called apostles meet. I've yet to hear of one that actually meets this. But it's laid out in verse 21. Therefore, if these men who have accompanied with all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they proposed to Joseph called Sar Bar Sabbath, who was surnamed Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, know the hearts of all. Show which of these two you have chosen. Take part in this ministry and the apostleship for which Judas by transgression felt that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So what is that qualification here? I'll go back to the previous slide. They had to be absolute, must a witness of the resurrected Christ. To become an apostle of Christ, you would have had to have had that resurrection vision where you saw the resurrected Christ and he commissioned you and sends you forth to be an apostle. And of course, there were several other qualifications, but this is the big one. An apostle also was one that had a signs, wonders, and miracles ministry. And of course, as you see, since Judas fell out, an apostle had to be one who was faithful to the faith once and for all revealed to the saints. If someone claims to be an apostle and they start preaching damn rule heresy, you can rest assured that Jesus Christ did not send them. So this is the basis of an apostolic encounter. Saul had this encounter. He saw the resurrected Christ in the Shekinah glory of God. He saw Christ transfigured, and Christ sent him. And, we're, and, and Christ wasn't done sending him, but Christ gave him the command to go. And in the subsequent slides, we're going to see Paul's journey where he comes into the church. And he has a hard time getting accepted into the church, and for good reason. The early believers didn't want anything to do with him. They was afraid he was going to skin them alive. But going back to uh, back to Acts nine, back to our, our our current discussion here in his conversion to Christ. And so Saul seen the resurrected Christ. Christ is saying it's hard for you to kick against the goats. He's saying, I have a different purpose where I am sending you. I am saddling you up. I am yoking you to myself to do this purpose. And so then Saul trembles and astonished, saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord says, arise and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. God did not call the man that was with Saul. 
And these men that were with him, you might ask, who are these men? The Bible only says there were others with him. But most likely, since he had letters to place people under arrest, these other men would be the hired muscle that would be needed to uh, physically overpower, detain, and arrest people and take them bound and in chains. Uh, you know, sh short Saul of Tarsus, they wasn't going to go just because he said you were under arrest. So he had men to ensure that they came whether they wanted to or not. These men saw no one. They were not called to be an apostle. Saul was called out to be an apostle. And so in verse 8, Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. So he finishes his trip to Damascus, not the way he thought he was going to finish it. He was led by the hand because we're going to find out here that that encounter made him blind. Once the vision was over with, he, he was not able to see. He needed healing so that he could see with his physical eyes. Verse 9, And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. So he was blind and fasting. Verse 10, And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight. Inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. So Saul's just got saved. He's immediately seeking the Lord. He's praying. He's fasting. And he's blind in the physical senses. He's drawn close to the Lord. And so God calls Ananias and says, Saul of Tarsus is praying. A lot of people in the charismatic world, you know, and naturally so, just blindly so, we all want to see God's power. And we have a growing awareness that if it's just our own power, our own machinations, our own wisdom is not going to be enough. And so when people think of revival, they, they think of God coming in dreams and visions. And that's good. We, we should. And Ananias was among the early Christians who did that. But now he got a dream that was more than what he bargained for. Because he's being asked to go to the house of somebody who was en route to arrest him. And the Lord says he is praying. At this point, Ananias is shocked. He's perplexed. Verse 12 here. And in a vision, he has seen Ananias. God's telling Ananias, he's saying, I've already told him about you. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so he might receive his sight. So Ananias' per purpose was to go to Damascus, lay his hands on Saul so that Saul could be healed of the blindness that came apart through the energies of the Shekinah glory of God when he had the apostolic vision. That must have been some vision. The 11 apostles had a similar vision, but there's no record that they was blinded. But Saul had such a powerful vision, it blinded his physical eyes. In verse 13, Ananias said, Lord, I've heard about from many about this man, how much harm he has caused to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. So Ananias is answering, and he's not really pushing back, but he, he has he's sharing his concerns with the Lord. The Lord, I'm concerned now. I'm going to go to jail here. And so he shares his concerns with the Lord. This was the Lord's reply. Verse 15, but the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And so what does Ananias do? He goes his way. He, he obeys the command of the Lord. And so Ananias went his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. 
So we see Ananias lays on hands. There's healing. Saul's filled with the Holy Spirit. And so then he is baptized. Brought into the church. Of course, uh, you know, Saul wastes no time. Upon being baptized, he, uh, he breaks his fast. Now, I don't know if he had his breakfast at breakfast, but he broke his fast. And when he had received food, he was strengthened. And Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. And he immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Then all who heard were amazed and saying, Is this not he who destroyed those who call on his name of Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? So people are beside themselves. They're saying, What's happening here? We knew he, we knew he was coming into town, but he's doing the opposite of what we thought he was going to do. He was supposed to be uh, destroying a church. Now he's building a church. He's supposed to be attacking the name of Christ. Now he's proclaiming the same Messiah that he attacked just days ago. But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews and dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. God had already revealed a whole lot of things to Saul including uh, bringing to his remembrance all the prophecies about Jesus, how Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets, that how he was the seed of the woman, he was the son of Abraham, he was the son of David, he was the last Adam. And we're going to be hearing more uh, about this in the days to come, uh, how he fulfilled all the covenants, he fulfilled the law, he fulfilled the prophets. We found out a couple weeks ago how he fulfilled Isaiah 53 and the Ethiopian eunuch was brought to the Lord. So Saul was bringing forth these prophecies, preaching out of the Old Testament, showing his fellow Jews that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. And he confounded them. They were not able to resist his wisdom. They were not able to refute what he had to say. And so what happens when people can't refute the truth? They try to shut it down. Censorship is not new. It, it's gone on for thousands of years and uh, not always benign as Facebook jail. Censorship can mean a hangman's rope. It can mean being stoned or having the sword put to you. And in verse 23, after many days were passed, the Jews decided that they were going to plot to kill him. So the Jews plotted to kill him. God wasn't done with Saul. But the plot became known to Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. So they had guards at the gates 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If he left out of any gate, they, they had him, and they had numbers. So what did they do? They took him by night. They let him down through the wall in a large basket. So he would literally scale the wall down in some kind of basket they lowered. And so uh, he, he left the walls and left the city without going through a gate. And God preserved him. And of course, we're going to go uh, to his trip in Jerusalem now, because after he had then went out of the gate, he made a trip to Jerusalem. When Saul had come to the Jerusalem, verse 26, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And for a long time, Paul and Barnabas were a team. And in fact, we read that they was numbered with the apostles. Barnabas was a man filled with the Holy Spirit. Always saw the best in people. Including eventually John Mark. We'll later get into that story. They split over John Mark because Barnabas wants to give John Mark a second chance. Paul says no. Because John Mark had previously bailed from the work. He, he chickened out when the heat was on and Paul didn't want to use him again. But Barnabas was willing to do that. 
His name literally means son of encouragement. He was an encourager. And so he reaches out to Paul in that same vein that he reached out later to John Mark to bring him to the apostles. So Barnabas takes the risk to reach out to Paul. He brings him to the apostles. And he declared to him how he had seen the Lord on the road and he had spoken to him and how he preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So Paul goes to those who were recognized as apostles and he's given his apostolic testimony. And it's resonating with the apostles. Verse 28, so when he was with them in Jerusalem, coming in and going out, and he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists, but they attempted to kill him. When the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him to Tarsus. Then the churches throughout Ogea, Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified and walking in fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and they were multiplied. So Saul goes to preach in Jerusalem, runs into trouble. They bring him out to Tarsus. We're going to find out later that at some point in this, between here and when we start getting into chapter 13, where Paul is then sent on his missionary journeys. At one point, he spends three years in Arabia. And I believe what was happening is that he spent extended time in the presence of God, seeking God, studying, preparing for what would be the meat of his apostolic ministry. But at, at this juncture, we're about to switch from Saul to Peter. And the rest of the chapter is about Peter's healing ministry. And so we're, we're going to find out that Peter is getting ready to go down into an area known as Joppa. Which was called Joppa back then. Today we would say that it was the area of Tel Aviv, Joppa, metropolis in Israel by the Mediterranean Sea. Now verse 32. Now it came to pass as Peter went through all the parts of the country that he also came down to the saints who dwelled in Lydda. And he found a certain man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden eight years and was paralyzed. And he said, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. Then he arose immediately. Verse 35, so all who dwelt at Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. At Joppa there were certain disciples named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. But it happened those days that she became sick and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. So this Tabitha, or this, uh, which is translated Dorcas, she was full of good works. She had a very good reputation. She gets sick. She dies. Washing her is referring to the ceremonial treatments that would be done in preparation for burial. They were getting set to have her funeral. And then when Peter shows up, and since Lydda was near Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he had come, they brought him to the upper room, and all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter was now in the funeral parlor. And this isn't the first time in the Bible we've seen resurrection power. We even saw it uh, on occasion in the Old Testament. Elijah did some resurrecting. And then, of course, we know Jesus resurrect, raised Lazarus. And then Jesus himself was resurrected from the dead. Guess what we're about to see, folks? We're about to see another resurrection, another raising from the dead. But Peter put them all out and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and windows, he presented her alive. Tabitha rose from the dead. And it became known throughout all Joppa. And many believed on the Lord. And so it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon a Tanner. 
So Peter, so while Saul was in Damascus in Jerusalem, Peter was in Joppa by the Mediterranean Sea doing a mighty work, uh, working in a town that uh, 2,000 years later would be known as Tel Aviv Yapo. Literally, the individual municipality is one called Jaffa, which is a part of the Tel Aviv metropolis in modern-day Israel. And I believe God's getting set to do another mighty work of revival. So what does that mean for us today? It means if you feel like you're up against the wall, like your back's against the wall. If you're stressing over the political turmoil that's going on, or maybe stressing over the family turmoil that's going on, or for many, it may be financial turmoil that's going on, or you're stressing over the world events that's going on, or the condition of the church, and you feel like you're powerless to change any of the trajectories, you may even be at the point of despair of saying, God, why am I even here? But all it takes, folks, just before Paul's trip, it was looking bad for the church. And in other places it's written, he began to destroy the church. He was a very efficient persecutor. And he was, he was determined that he was going to kill more Christians than Christians were, than people were becoming born again to destroy the church. But in a moment, all that change, all that it takes for everything to change is for Jesus Christ to show up. You might be on your road to Damascus. I have a relative that I'm praying for who's in dire straits as I speak, he is in a harrowing situation. He needs a road to Damascus experience for the Lord to dramatically show up. We should pray, we should ask God, Lord Jesus, show up. We need you to show up on the stage. And who knows, there might be somebody that the Lord shows up and they literally see the vision of the resurrected Christ. And there's others of us that we might not see him, but he shows up and we feel him. He shows up and the trajectory of things change. That situation just seemed intractable before that, there, that a way is made out. And so finishing this segment, I want to encourage all of us to draw close to God, to ask him to show up, to ask him to accompany us on our road to Damascus. Heavenly Father, we come right now in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we just ask you to show up mightily in a church. Lord, we need you to show up. All hell is breaking loose on earth. There are so many problems on so many levels. It seems that it's hard to get a handle on all of it. But Lord, we know that all it takes to change all of it is for you to show up, to reveal yourself. So, Lord, we ask you to show up, reveal yourself. Give us power to do what you have called us to do. <coughs> and reveal yourself to those who have desperately apprehend those that you have called to, to bring them out of sin into darkness. But Saul's not the only one that found it hard to kick against the goats. There's others who find themselves in that same situation because you've apprehended them to go on a much different journey than what they started out on. Saul set out on one journey. He ended doing another journey. So, Lord, we ask just you reveal yourself. Show up in our lives. Show up in our church. Lord, we ask you in this great return revival event that's happening here in just a couple of weeks to show up mightily to save, to heal, to deliver, to restore. And where necessary, show up to do justice for those who need justice done on their behalf, who cannot get justice through the normal human channels. Lord, we ask you to show up. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.